Before we start, let me remind you of the channel membership for this channel. If you click the Join button, right below the Like button, you can join the membership and support the channel for as low as 99 cents per month. In return, you will get a cool Jason Voorhees mask badge next to your name when you comment on any of my videos, and four emotes that you can use in live stream and premieres chat. Ed Gein, Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, and Edmund Kemper. Show this channel some love. Now, back to our video. When Officer Daniel Wright of the South San Francisco Police responded to a routine shoplifting call at South City Lumberyard, he had no idea what he was about to uncover. All that he knew was that a sales clerk had witnessed an Asian man hiding a bench vice inside his jacket and had asked another employee to call the police. When he arrived at the scene, he pulled up next to a 1980 Honda Prelude and was approached by the clerk and another larger man with a beard. The clerk pointed out the vice, which lay in the open trunk of the Honda, and told Wright that he had seen the Asian man put it there before running off. Wright looked into the car and saw another bag containing what he thought was a handgun. After a closer inspection of the bag, he found a loaded 22 revolver and a silencer. At this point, the bearded man approached Wright and showed him a sales receipt. Here's the receipt, he said. I've paid for the vice my friend took. There's no need for the police. Without answering, Officer Wright returned to his car and used his radio to check the Honda's registration number. While he was waiting for a response, he asked the bearded man, Who does this car belong to? The man replied, Lonnie Bond. Where is she? Wright asked. Up north, came the reply. At the time, Wright returned to the radio and was informed that the Honda's registration number, 838WFQ, belonged to a Buick registered in the name of Lonnie Bond. After advising the man that swapping the registration plates was a crime, Wright asked for ID and was given a driver's license in the name of Robin S. Stapley, a 26-year-old San Diego resident. At that point, Wright became increasingly suspicious as the bearded man looked considerably older than the age stated on the license. Wright then picked up the gun and asked the man, Don't you know it's illegal to carry a silenced weapon? It's not mine. It belongs to Lonnie. I just use it to shoot beer cans. Wright then used the radio a second time to check the serial number of the weapon and found that it was registered to Robin S. Stapley. You're under arrest, Wright told the bearded man. What for? Owning an illegal weapon. I told you, it's not mine, the man replied. You say that you're Stapley, right? Well, the gun is registered in your name. After handcuffing the man and reading him his rights, Officer Wright locked him in the rear of the car and returned to the sales clerk to obtain a description of the other man, which he then broadcast. Asian male, slight build, about 25, last seen wearing a parka. After arranging for the Honda to be towed to the police impound yard, Wright drove his prisoner to South City Police Station, where he was placed in an interrogation room and told to empty his pockets. Among his possessions, he had a travel receipt in the name of Charles Gunnar. Who's Gunnar? Wright asked. At that point, another officer advised Wright that the vehicle identification number on the Honda revealed that it belonged to a man named Paul Cosner, who had been reported missing to the San Francisco police nine months earlier. When Wright told the bearded man what he had been told, the man went pale and asked for a pen and paper and a glass of water. Are you going to write a confession? Wright asked. No, the man answered. Just a note to my wife. After asking for his handcuffs to be released, the man scribbled a short note and placed it in his shirt pocket. I can have that delivered for you if you like, Wright told him. The man then said, I didn't think a lousy bench vice would bring me to this. When Wright asked him to repeat what he'd said, the man continued, My friend's name is Charlie Cheetah Ng. Cheetah pronounced Cheetah and Ng pronounced Ng. He then told Wright that his real name was Leonard Lake and that he was a fugitive wanted by the FBI. Without saying another word, Lake then took something from the lapel of his shirt and placed it in his mouth. Within seconds, his eyes rolled back in his head and he went into convulsions. Wright called for help and checked the prisoner's pulse. He was alive, but just barely. Police later discovered that Lake had taped two cyanide capsules to the underside of his shirt lapel. As the paramedics carried Lake to an ambulance and conveyed him to hospital, Wright wondered why a man would want to kill himself over a stolen car. He was soon to get his answer. It wasn't long before South San Francisco police knew that they had more than a simple case of shoplifting on their hands, especially when they discovered bloodstains on the front passenger's seat of the Honda, a bullet hole above it near the sun visor, and two spent shell casings under the seat. 
Paul Cosner, 39, the original owner of the Honda and a trader of used cars, had disappeared on November 2nd, 1984, after he told his girlfriend that he was meeting with a weird-looking guy to show him the car. He was never seen again. The car and the property were later moved to San Francisco, as detectives from the missing persons unit there were investigating the disappearance of Paul Cosner. Among the property were several bank and credit cards, and other documents in the name of Robin Scott Stapley, which had been found in the glove compartment. A check made with San Diego police revealed that Stapley was one of the founding members of the San Diego chapter of the Guardian Angels, a national organization that had been formed to protect private citizens from criminal attacks and generally aid the police. He had been missing since the previous April. Another bank card, in the name of Randy Jacobson, was also found amongst the property, as was a Pacific Gas and Electric bill in the name of Clara Lynn Balaz. The address shown on the bill was a post office box in Wilseyville, California, a region 150 miles east of San Francisco at the foot of the Sierra Nevada Mountains. After checks with PG&E, police discovered that Balaz was Lake's ex-wife and was living in San Bruno, just a few short miles from the lumber yard where Lake had been arrested. On Monday, June 3, 1985, two detectives from San Francisco Missing Persons, Tom Eisenman and Irene Brunn, went to interview Balaz. When asked about the Wilseyville address, Balaz told the police that it related to a cabin that her father owned near San Andreas, Calaveras County. When the detectives asked for directions to the cabin, Balaz explained that it was in a remote location and could only be found by someone familiar with the area. The detectives then made arrangements for Balaz to take them to the cabin the following day, as they first required authorization from the Calaveras Sheriff's Department to conduct a search. The following day, after meeting with Sheriff Ballard and obtaining the necessary clearance, Eisenman, Brunn, and two other officers supplied by Ballard met Balaz and Lake's mother, Gloria Eberling, at a grocery store located on Highway 88, a short distance from the cabin. When the detectives asked Balaz why she was late for their appointment, she explained that she had been to the cabin prior to meeting them. The police then advised her that if she had removed any evidence, she could be found guilty of obstructing justice. Balaz explained that she had been looking for videos that Lake had taken of her in the nude and had only wanted to save herself from embarrassment. Shortly after, Balaz led them up Blue Mountain Road and after just two turns, they drove past a cinder block structure and came to the cabin. Contrary to Balaz's advice, it had been relatively easy to find. After asking Balaz to unlock the cabin, Brun and Calaveras Deputy Sheriff Arrain conducted a search of the interior while Eisenman and the other deputy looked around the grounds. The cabin was comprised of two bedrooms, a kitchen, and a bathroom. The first thing that Brun noted on entering the room was a spray of reddish-colored stains on the living room ceiling. On one wall was a mural of a forest scene. In the middle of the scene was a single, small-caliber bullet hole. Entering the kitchen, Brun found another similar bullet hole in the floor. The master bedroom held a four-poster bed that had electrical cords tied to each of its posts. Bolted through the floor at each corner of the bed were heavy eye bolts, and above it, a 250-watt floodlight had been fastened to the wall. To one side of the bed was a dresser, which contained an assortment of women's lingerie, many of which were soiled with dark red stains. Moving to the bed, Brun lifted one corner of the mattress. Below it was a second mattress. It, too, was heavily stained with what looked like dried blood. Returning to the front room, she was shown a television and two items of audio duplicating equipment by Deputy Varane. All the serial numbers had been erased. Brun later found that the audio equipment belonged to Harvey Dubs, a San Francisco resident who, with his wife and baby son, had disappeared on July 24, 1984. The family was last seen by a neighbor who saw them talking to two men who had come to the house to inquire about the equipment which Harvey Dubs had advertised for sale in a local paper. Brun then left the property with Varane and drove to the office of the San Andreas District Attorney and spoke with Assistant DA John Martin, who, after listening to their report, agreed that they had sufficient evidence to request a search warrant for the whole property. After obtaining the warrant from Judge Douglas Mewini, Brun and Varane returned to the property and conducted a brief interview with Balaz and Eberling, questioning them about their previous visit to the cabin. Eberling refused to answer any questions, and Balaz became evasive, stating only that her parents had bought the cabin from the fat guy. When she had finished with Balaz and her mother, Eisenman took Brun to another part of the yard and showed her an incinerator with thick fireproof walls that were capable of withstanding extreme temperatures. 
Aware that the previous occupants of the cabin were in some way involved in the disappearance of several people, Brunn and Eisenman decided that a detailed examination of the entire area, including the incinerator and the mysterious concrete bunker, was a priority. As their search warrant didn't cover the locked bunker, Brunn asked Balas if she would give them consent to search it. Balas responded to their request angrily, suggesting that they talk to Lake's partner, Charles Ng. Brun asked for more details on Ng and was told that he was an Asian who normally hung out with Lake. When asked if she had seen Ng recently, Balas told the detectives that Ng had rung the previous day and asked her to drive him to his apartment to pick up a paycheck. She then told them that Ng had packed a suitcase with clothes, a 22 handgun, ammunition, a large amount of cash, and two IDs, a California driver's license and a social security card, both in the name of Mike Himoto. Afterward, she had driven him to the United Airlines terminal at San Francisco Airport, but had no idea where he was going. Balaz was then asked for more information on Lake and told the detectives that she and Lake had met at a Renaissance fair in Marin County and had married after dating for a short time. As his best man, Lake had chosen Charles Gunnar, a longtime friend who, at just 5'8", weighed nearly 400 pounds, prompting Balaz to christen him the fat man. Shortly after the wedding, which was paid for by Gunner, the couple moved to Philo in Mendocino, where Lake found work managing a motel. Within a year, Ng had arrived and moved in with Lake and his new wife. According to Balaz, Lake and Ng got on well, as they were both former Marines. In 1982, five months after his arrival, Ng left for several days and returned late one night driving a pickup. Balaz told the detectives that on the night of Ng's return, he and Lake had performed a strange dance in the yard and later unpacked some crates from the truck and placed them in a shed. Early the following morning, an FBI SWAT team raided the property and arrested Ng and Lake and charged them in relation to the theft of weapons from a military base in Hawaii. Lake was later released on $30,000 bail, which was paid by Gunner, while Ng, who was still considered a serving member of the Marine Corps, was court-martialed and sentenced to two years in Leavenworth Prison. Not wishing to go to jail, Lake made plans to run off and hide in the mountains and asked Balaz to go with him. When she refused, the relationship broke down and Lake moved into the cabin alone. Although Balaz had spoken freely about her life with Lake, when Brun pushed for more details on his relationship with Ng, Balaz became angry, refused the detective's permission to enter the bunker, and demanded to speak with an attorney. Shortly after, Balaz and Eberling left. After relaying the information regarding Ng's movements and alias to their office, Brun and Eisenman left the site to request an additional search warrant for the bunker. Because of the information they had uncovered, their request was given top priority and a joint task force was set up to search the entire site. San Francisco Police Chief Cornelius Murphy authorized a 12-man unit and Sheriff Ballard of Calaveras County assembled a team of five men and placed Lieutenant Bob Bunning in charge. Deputy Chief of Inspectors Joseph Lorden was placed in charge of the San Francisco Detachment. On Tuesday, June 4, 1985, the search began. The first task was to set up a base camp while the locksmith was summoned to unlock the bunker. A preliminary examination of the area around the bunker was then conducted, which revealed a cleared area 10 feet in diameter that showed traces of lye and a long trench that seemed to contain articles of clothing. Fearing a grave site, Sheriff Allard ordered the searchers to focus their attention on those areas, while he sent an officer to find out who owned the neighboring property. Within hours, a team of sniffer dogs and their handlers, a forensic specialist, and two additional patrolmen had joined the search. While Ballard was coordinating his search party, the officer returned from the house next door with more disturbing information. The owner of that property, Bo Carter, who had been contacted by telephone, informed the officers that the house was a rental. Some weeks before, his tenants, Lonnie Bond, his partner Brenda O'Connor, and their infant son, Lonnie Jr., had fallen behind on their rent, so he had sent a real estate agent to collect it. When the agent arrived, a man calling himself Charles Gunner came from the direction of the cabin and told him that the tenants had left ten days previously. At that time, the agent informed Carter that another man, by the name of Robin Stapley, had been living with the Bonds prior to their disappearance. The agent had also told Carter that an eroded bank near the boundary between the two properties had been recently dug up. Disturbed by the news, Carter went to the site a week later to inspect his property. When he arrived, a man calling himself Charles Gunner had approached him and watched as he inspected the house. Carter said he didn't worry about Gunner until he saw a TV news item about a man who took cyanide following his arrest for a weapons charge. The news item had also shown the man's picture and given his name. According to Carter, the man he had seen near the cabin was Leonard Lake. 
After hearing the story, Ballard sent searchers to find the area described by the agent. The following day, the bunker was opened. Sheriff Allard, Detectives Brunn and Eisenman, and the Calaveras County Information Officer, Jim Stenquist, conducted the initial search. The main room was a 20-foot by 12-foot workshop area with a range of hand tools and power saws hanging on a plywood wall next to a workbench. On closer inspection, many of the tools were found to be encrusted with a dried brownish substance, possibly blood. Attached to the bench was a broken vise. As they inspected the room further, the detectives checked the dimensions of it and discovered that it was smaller than the size it seemed from the outside and deduced that there may be a hidden room. They soon found that a plywood tool rack was in fact a door leading to a smaller room. Inside were a double bed, a side table, books, and a reading lamp. On one wall was a wooden plaque with the legend Operation Miranda carved into it. Police would later learn that the name was derived from a book called The Collector by John Fowles, which was found in the bookshelf. The book tells the story of a butterfly collector who kidnaps a beautiful woman and keeps her locked in his cellar, where the woman eventually dies. The room also contained military equipment, including uniforms, boots, and a vast array of weapons, including assault rifles, shotguns, and machine guns. On the floor, police found a work shirt and a baseball cap with the words Dennis Moving Service embroidered on them. In a bookshelf on the far wall, between books on explosives and chemicals, the searchers found a small window that appeared to be made up of multiple panes of glass, possibly soundproofed. On another shelf was a military starlight scope, which, initially designed for snipers, was capable of viewing objects in extremely low light conditions. On another wall were 21 candid photographs of young girls in various stages of undress, most of which were taken outdoors. Two of the pictures had been taken in front of wallpaper with a cartoon character motif. Police would eventually identify the wallpaper as being the same as that in the South City Juvenile Hall, the same location that Clara Lynn Balaz worked as a teacher's assistant. All 21 women were later identified and found to be alive and well. After checking their measurements again, the detectives found that there was another discrepancy indicating that there may be a third room behind the small window. Sheriff Ballard was informed, but refused the searchers' permission to continue with the search until the forensic technicians had collected evidence from the first two rooms. The first find by the technicians was a single adult fingerprint taken from the bookshelf window. Later, they found other prints on and around the same window, which were retained until the fingerprint records of Lake, Ng, and missing person files could be obtained for comparison. The fingerprints on and around the window were later positively identified as belonging to Ng and Lake. As the technicians continued their analysis, searchers outside uncovered two bones beside the driveway but were unable to ascertain if they were human. They were later sent to Dr. Boyd Stevens, San Francisco's chief medical examiner, for further analysis. On the second day at the site, the lab crew responsible for the search of the cabin found additional evidence in the form of a 22 caliber bullet that was removed from the wall of the main bedroom. Under the springs of the bed in the same room, they found a diary, which later proved to be written by Leonard Lake and described in chilling detail how he and Ng had selected and murdered numerous victims. It also described how Lake, an ardent survivalist who feared nuclear war, had planned to build a series of bunkers across the country, complete with supplies, weapons, and female sex slaves. The diary further spelled out his intentions to use his female captives to repopulate the world. By 5 p.m. on the second day, the initial forensic analysis of the bunker had been completed and Ballard ordered Brunn and Eisenman to continue their search of the interior. After checking what looked like a sealed room, Brunn found a secret door behind a bookcase that led into the room with a window. The room itself was only 3 foot 3 inches wide by 7 and a half feet long with a 6 foot ceiling. Inside, they found a narrow bed, a chemical toilet, air freshener, and a water container. Holes had been drilled in the wall to provide ventilation, but had been baffled to exclude light. After closely examining both rooms at the same time, they discovered that the window was two-way glass. They later discovered a button beside it which, when pushed, allowed the occupants of the first room to hear any sounds from within the smaller room. Eisenman then turned off all the lights in the bunker and, using the starlight scope through the viewing window, was able to see Brunn clearly in the smaller room. They had discovered what looked like a hostage cell. When the newest information was relayed to Ballard, he left the site and returned to his office, where he made plans for a full-scale murder investigation, 
which would include the FBI, the Californian Forestry Department, and the Californian Department of Justice. On day three, the searches were assisted by another specialist attachment of dogs and their handlers from the Californian Rescue Dogs Association. After an hour of fruitless searching, Ballard called for heavy equipment to begin digging out the site. During the same morning, Ballard received an unexpected visitor in the form of Gloria Eberling, Lake's mother. She told Ballard that she had come because she was concerned about her other son, Donald, who had disappeared two years earlier. Brunn, who was also present, asked Eberling if Ballas had removed anything from the cabin on the day they met and was told that Ballas had taken 12 videotapes from the main bedroom. Ballas later gave police the 12 videos she had taken from the cabin, which, as she had indicated, were of her and Lake having sex. Ballard then asked Eberling if Lake's condition had improved. She told him that her son had been officially pronounced brain dead and doctors were pressing her to switch off his life support. For Ballard, the case was becoming a nightmare. He had evidence that suggested multiple kidnappings and murders and two main suspects, but one was virtually dead and the other was in hiding, possibly in another country. All he could do was collect the evidence and wait. The FBI, meanwhile, had determined that Charles Zing had taken a flight from San Francisco to Chicago, but they were unable to ascertain where he had gone from there. After a check of his background, they found that he had come from Hong Kong, had sisters in Toronto and Calgary, an uncle in Yorkshire, England, and former Marine friends in Hawaii. They were aware that, with sufficient funds and several days' lead, Ng could be in any of the four locations. To assist in their search, they contacted Interpol and Scotland Yard and distributed Ng's description worldwide. On the fourth day of the search, Dr. Stevens arrived at the site and informed Ballard that the bones found near the driveway were definitely human. Shortly after he arrived, another bone was found, which appeared to have been cut neatly on both ends by a saw or similar cutting tool. As the search progressed, numerous items were unearthed from various locations. In the trench that ran from the bunker to the entry road, police found a plastic bag containing a letter addressed to Charles Ng and a receipt in the name of Harvey Dubs. Next, they unearthed a shirt with the name Scott embroidered on it. Literally hundreds of items, which had to be painstakingly photographed and held for analysis, were removed from the site. It wasn't until the fifth day that the first bodies were found. The skeletal remains of two people seemed to be complete, but the bones had been sawn into sections and badly burned. Ironically, at 8 p.m. on the same day the skeletons were found, the doctors at Kaiser Permanente Hospital switched off Leonard Lake's life support. He died within seconds. Later, a sealed five-gallon bucket was uncovered, which contained a checkbook in the name of Robin Scott Stapley, jewelry, credit cards, driver's licenses, wallets, and two videotapes without labels, and a third marked M. Ladies, Kathy Brenda. The first two videos were later viewed, the first showing Lake and Ballas at a Thanksgiving dinner. On the second, Lake had been filmed discussing his greatest fantasy, kidnapping a woman and enslaving her. The third video was the most disturbing. It showed a young woman, identified only as Kathy, chained to a chair and later forced to perform a striptease while being taunted by two men, Lake and Ng. In another part of the video, Ng could be seen clearly cavorting on a bed with Kathy while Lake took still photographs. The young woman was later identified as 18-year-old Kathy Allen, a clerk at a supermarket in Milpitas. Allen was apparently lured to the site by Lake, who told her that her boyfriend had been shot. Police later revealed that Allen's boyfriend, a known drug dealer named Michael Sean Carroll, had been Ng's cellmate in Leavenworth. The tape also included footage of another young woman named Brenda, which showed her begging for information regarding her baby. In answer, Lake tells her, Your baby is sound asleep like a rock. Eventually, when the constant barrage of taunts and threats breaks her resolve, Brenda agrees to cooperate. Later in the tape, she can be heard taking a shower with both men. The second victim shown on the tape was 19-year-old Brenda O'Connor, Lake's next-door neighbor. Police believe that her common-law husband, Lonnie Bond, and their baby, Lonnie Jr., were murdered by Lake and Ng prior to the tape being made. As the search progressed, the searchers uncovered a partial skull, another plastic bucket containing personal items, and a complete, albeit burned, body. Within minutes, four more bodies, including that of a child, were uncovered. Two were female, the other a black male. A short time later, another plastic container and a long 12-inch diameter metal tube were unearthed. Inside the container, police found 1,863 silver dollars, more wallets, and credit cards. 
The tube contained a Colt AR-15 semi-automatic rifle. In another search of a mound of freshly dug earth some distance from the cabin, two more bodies were uncovered. Both had been killed by a single, small-caliber bullet to the head. The bunker was later completely demolished in the search for more bodies. As the search wound down, the bodies of seven men, three women, two baby boys, and 45 pounds of bone fragments had been recovered, along with numerous amounts of property belonging to the deceased. In all, police found evidence suggesting that up to 25 people who had previously been reported missing may have been murdered in or around the Wisleyville compound, but the fact that most of the bodies had been cut up, burnt, and scattered around the site made identification extremely difficult. Eventually, a warrant was issued for the arrest of Charles Cheetah Ng for 12 murders. The victims would eventually be identified as Kathleen Allen, her boyfriend Michael Carroll, Robin Scott Stapley, Randy Johnson, Charles the Fat Man Gunner, Lake's best man, Donald Lake, Leonard's brother, Paul Cosner, the owner of the Honda, Brenda O'Connor, Lonnie Bond Sr., Lonnie Bond Jr., Lake's next-door neighbors, and Harvey Dubbs, Deborah Dubbs, and Sean Dubbs. The Dubs family had been abducted and killed after Ng and Lake went to their house in relation to audio equipment that Harvey Dubs had advertised for sale. While Sheriff Ballard and his team were working 12 hours a day to unearth the grisly secrets of the Wilseyville compound, the FBI was gathering additional information on one of the people believed to be responsible for the carnage, Charles Cheetah Ng. They learned that Ng had been born in Hong Kong on December 24, 1961. The son of a wealthy businessman, he was given every opportunity life could offer, but Charlie developed a rebellious streak at a young age and was expelled from several schools. Anxious for his son to change his ways, his father sent him to a boarding school in Yorkshire, England, where he would be under the protection of his uncle, who was a teacher at the school. After a short time at the new school, Charles was caught stealing from other students and a local department store and was, once again, expelled. He then returned to Hong Kong until, at the age of 18, he obtained a student visa to study in the U.S. and attended Notre Dame College in Belmont, California. Obviously, the life of a student didn't appeal to him as he dropped out after just one semester. In October 1979, Ng was charged in relation to a hit-and-run accident. He was later convicted and ordered to pay damages. Shortly after, he enlisted in the Marines, even though he wasn't an American citizen, listing Bloomfield, Indiana as his place of birth. In 1981, Ng had been promoted to the rank of Lance Corporal. His military career ended shortly after, however, when he and three accomplices stole military weapons from an armory at Kaneho Marine Base in Hawaii. A month later, he was arrested by the military police and locked up. Within days of his incarceration, he escaped and made his way to California, where he met up with Leonard Lake. One story suggests that the two met as a result of an ad that Lake had placed in a survivalist magazine, but this information cannot be verified. Not long after, he moved in with Lake and Balaz until the FBI arrested them for weapons offenses. Following his release from Leavenworth in June 1984, Ng returned to California and moved into the Wilseyville cabin with Lake. Ng should have been deported following his release from Leavenworth, but the Marine Corps were still unaware that he was not an American citizen. The FBI estimates their kidnapping and killing spree started within a month of their reunion. In July 1984, Donald Guletti, a San Francisco disc jockey, and his roommate Richard Carraza were shot by an Asian man who broke into their apartment and robbed them. Guletti died in the attack, but Carraza survived and would later identify Charles Ng as his attacker. The pistol used in the attack was found at the Wilseyville site. Gradually, the FBI was successful in tracing Ng's movements after leaving San Francisco. On the day that Clara Lynn Ballas had driven him to the airport, he was seen boarding an American Airlines flight to Chicago. On his arrival, he booked into the Chateau Hotel under the name of Mike Komodo before checking out four days later. He then met up with an unidentified friend and traveled to Detroit before crossing the border into Canada alone. A search of his apartment revealed a cache of weapons and property allegedly belonging to the victims as well as a payslip from the Dennis Moving Company. The FBI also compiled a dossier on Leonard Lake, who obviously hadn't had the benefit of the privileged upbringing that Ng had enjoyed. He was born in San Francisco on October 29, 1945, to parents who were constantly fighting. His birth obviously did nothing to ease their domestic conflict as he was sent to live with various relatives until, at the age of six, he found a permanent home with his grandparents. According to statements from his friends and relatives, Lake was never able to come to terms with his feelings of rejection and abandonment. 
At the age of 19, Lake left home and enlisted in the Marines, where he was trained as a radar operator. Following his specialist training, he was sent to Da Nang in Vietnam. According to his medical records, Lake was hospitalized during his first tour for exhibiting incipient psychotic reactions. Obviously, his superiors did not consider his condition serious as he was treated and returned to his unit to finish his tour. A second tour lasted a few short months before it was cut short when Lake was deemed to be suffering from unspecified medical problems and returned to El Toro Marine Base in Orange County. In all, he served seven years, earning the Vietnam Service Medal, a Vietnam Campaign Medal, and two other medals for good conduct. He was later discharged on medical grounds and went to live in San Jose, California. Shortly after his release, he entered the Oakland Veterans Administration Hospital, where he was treated for psychological problems. Following his release, he briefly attended college at San Jose State University. Five years after his discharge, he met Clara Lynn Balaz at a Renaissance fair in Marin County, where he ran a stall, charging visitors for photographs posed with a goat that he had disguised as a unicorn. In 1981, Lake and Balaz were married and moved to a commune located in Philo, Mendocino County, Northern California. While in Philo, the Lakes lived in a sprawling ranch that Leonard called Alibi Run, where he allegedly grew marijuana. According to friends, it was about this time that Lake became delusional and converted his ranch into a survivalist enclosure and stocked it with weapons and supplies to ward off the siege that he believed was coming. Although Charles Zing managed to elude a nationwide manhunt for 34 days, his penchant for shoplifting led to his demise just as it had for Leonard Lake. On Saturday, July 6, 1985, two security guards in a Hudson's Bay store in Calgary approached Ng after he had attempted to leave the store with several grocery items secreted in a backpack. When they challenged him, Ng drew a gun and threatened them. A short scuffle followed, during which one of the officers was shot in the hand before Ng was overpowered and taken into custody. He was later charged at Calgary Metropolitan Police Station with robbery, attempted robbery, possession of a firearm, and attempted murder. As Charles Zing prepared to face the courts, news of his arrest reached the Calaveras Task Force. Any elation at his capture was soon dispelled, however, when John Crosby, the Canadian Justice Minister, announced that under the terms of a 1976 extradition treaty with the United States, he had refused the request for Ng's extradition, as Canada, having abolished capital punishment, would not release any prisoner charged with a capital crime that carried the death penalty. After the U.S. authorities had recovered from their shock, two San Francisco detectives were sent to interview Ng in his Calgary jail cell. He told them that it was Lake who was responsible for most of the Wilseyville killings, but admitted helping to dispose of Paul Cosner's body. Following the interview, the U.S. Justice Department made a renewed attempt to have Ng extradited, but the Canadian authorities refused, as they were about to bring Ng to trial for offenses committed on Canadian soil. He was later tried and convicted on the Calgary shoplifting and assault charges and sentenced to four and a half years imprisonment. As Ng prepared to serve his sentence, the United States Justice Department began what would become a long and protracted battle to extradite Charles Ng. The battle lasted almost six years. During this period, Ng spent most of his time studying American law. During the extradition proceedings, evidence was tabled that Ng had drawn several cartoons, which, according to U.S. attorneys, showed details of the Wilseyville killings that only someone with an intimate knowledge of the killings could produce. After dozens of appeals and a seemingly endless round of hearings, the Canadian government finally acceded to the Californian government's request and agreed to extradite Charles Ng on September 26, 1991. Within minutes of his release, Ng was flown to McClellan Air Force Base where he was transferred to Folsom Prison in Sacramento to await trial. What followed was the most drawn-out, costly criminal proceedings in U.S. criminal history, even outstripping the famous O.J. Simpson case. Ng used every point of law that he and his string of attorneys could muster to delay trial proceedings against him. The site for the trial was to be San Andreas, but Ng constantly filed actions against the state of California, making formal complaints on matters ranging from alleged poor treatment and bad food to the claim that he was forced to take medication for motion sickness during the 50-mile trip to the courthouse, which, he claimed, made him drowsy and unable to take part in pretrial proceedings. He gained further delays by dismissing his attorneys at regular intervals and later filed a $1 million malpractice suit against them for incompetence. At one stage, he filed a motion with the San Andreas court applying for the right to represent himself, but later withdrew it. 
The delaying tactics continued as Ng's attorneys applied to have the trial moved to Orange County as they believed that their client could not receive a fair trial in San Andreas. In support of this motion, the attorneys tabled an independent survey indicating that 95% of the residents of Calaveras County already considered Charles Ng guilty of the Wilseyville murders. These and other motions were brought before the California Supreme Court no less than five times until finally, on April 8, 1994, a San Andreas judge upheld the motion and ordered the trial move to Santa Ana in Orange County. This action caused further delays when Orange County officials objected to the order on the grounds that the county was virtually bankrupt and unable to bear the costs of such a trial. The issue was eventually resolved when the state of California agreed to pay any costs incurred. More years of legal wrangling ensued as Ng changed attorneys who in turn asked for further adjournments to prepare their case. At one point during the proceedings, Ng was housed in a small cage between appearances as he was considered highly dangerous. The cage was later removed when a federal magistrate described its use as barbarous. Even before the actual trial began, Ng had appeared before six different judges in a case that had amassed over six tons of evidence and other legal documents at a cost of approaching $10 million. In October 1998, after 13 years of delays and extended legal arguments, the trial of Charles Cheetah Ng began. For the next few months, the jury, the media, and the families and friends of the victims heard state prosecutor Charlene Honaco relate how Leonard Lake and Charles Zing had selected and kidnapped their victims before taking them to the Wilseyville site where they had sadistically tortured and murdered them. To support the state's case, Honaco submitted the videos that were found at the site that clearly showed Ng and Lake torturing and abusing Kathy Allen and Brenda O'Connor. Evidence, including stolen property and photographs, were also tabled, further linking both men to the victims. Hanukkah also attempted to submit excerpts from Lake's diaries as evidence, but Judge John J. Ryan refused to admit them, ruling that most of the material submitted bore no relevance to the case. Part of Lake's military record was also withheld. The defense countered, claiming that Ng was an unwilling accomplice to the more dangerous and demented Lake who was responsible for the murders, while Ng merely participated in some of the sexual offenses. Towards the end of the proceedings, Ng damaged his own case when he insisted on taking the stand, a move which allowed prosecutors to present additional evidence, including a picture of Ng in his cell, showing the incriminating cartoons behind him on the wall, next to a motto which read, No kill, no thrill, no gun, no fun. William Kelly, Ng's court-appointed attorney, attempted to regroup by calling Clara Lynn Ballas to give evidence in support of his client, even though the prosecution had previously granted her immunity. He later changed his mind when Judge Ryan advised him that Ballas had made prior statements implicating Ng. Finally, after a trial lasting eight long months, all the evidence had been heard and the jury retired to consider a verdict. Within hours, they returned. They found Charles Cheetah Ng guilty of the murders of six men, three women, and two baby boys. The charge of murdering the seventh man, Paul Cosner, had been dropped previously, owing to insufficient evidence. One of the key witnesses against Ng never testified. While imprisoned in Canada for the 1985 shoplifting and assault case, Ng had allegedly confessed to a fellow inmate, Maurice Laberge, that he had killed the Wilseyville victims. But Laberge died in an automobile accident just north of Calgary, Alberta, on May 19, 1998, before he could be called to testify. At one point during the trial, Ng had somehow managed to obtain the phone number of one of the jurors and contacted the juror at home in an unsuccessful attempt to cause a mistrial. In February 1999, Ng was convicted of 11 of the 12 homicides, six men, three women, and two male infants. Jurors found him not guilty on the 12th charge, the murder of Paul Cosner, despite the fact that Lake and Ng had driven Cosner's car for seven months since he went missing in November 1984, and Cosner's California driver's license had been found in the Wilseyville property. Ng was sentenced to death, and the presiding judge rejected a motion to reduce the jury's verdict to life imprisonment. Mr. Ng was not under any duress, he said, nor does the evidence support that he was under the domination of Leonard Lake. Ng's prosecution cost the state of California approximately $20 million, at the time the most expensive trial in the state's history. Ng remains on death row at San Quentin State Prison. No executions have taken place in California since 2006.